Hello and welcome to the answer to one of Follow the Boat's most frequently asked questions. What camera gear do you use for vlogging and do you have any recommendations? So this video is going to be useful for people that want to get into vlogging, people that like taking video and even if you have a passing interest in photography you may pick up a tip or two. And for those regular viewers who are looking for some boat action, we'll be on that next week. In this video, I'm going to be talking about your primary video camera. GoPros, fake GoPros, waterproof cameras, prime lenses, zoom lenses, external audio recording, lighting, more lighting, tripods, gimbals, drones, filters. So if you've no idea who we are, we are Liz and Jamie and we live aboard our boat Esper with our cat. We put out weekly videos of our life at sea. This is one of the most frequently asked questions. So we've made a point of making it easily accessible to people that just want to get into vlogging. So we're not going to be talking about the really expensive camera gear. We're going to be talking about stuff that's going to help you get into vlogging and also for anyone that just likes taking video and photos. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So vlogging on a boat isn't too different from normal vlogging and the official name for this style of videography is called run and gun or guerrilla filmmaking and it's a little bit different to normal filmmaking. Often, although not always, it's handheld, it's more spontaneous, you're using natural light and you shoot in a range of different environments where traditional filmmaking is much more controlled. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about some main themes that I think are the most important considerations when looking at camera gear, especially for vlogging, and specifically if you live on a boat. And these themes are stabilization, audio, portability, lighting, and budget. And I'll be covering the cost of this equipment as I go through them. And I'll also put some links in the description down below. But before I get technical and start talking about gear, there is one thing that I want you to take away from this video, and that is, it doesn't matter what you record your vlog on. There are a number of vloggers out there on YouTube who have millions of subscribers and they're just vlogging on phones and on compact cameras. So why do they have all these followers? They are concentrating on the story and not the gear on which they are telling it. And this is key to your vlog. Forget about the equipment. Forget what I'm gonna tell you. It's all about the story. So with run and gun, guerrilla style vlogging, you're gonna be moving around a lot, running down streets, on a boat, you could be hanging off a cable, trying to film yourself, winching. So there's gonna be a lot of movement. Now, sometimes this camera movement can actually add to the narrative, but more often than not, especially when you are holding the camera in front of you and talking to camera, there is nothing worse than jerky movement. So this brings me on to one of the most important things, I think, for a vlogging camera with this kind of lifestyle is stability. So the way in which we deal with stability can be done in a couple of ways. The first way is stabilization in camera or in lens. The second way is to use external equipment. And there is a third way, and that is to stabilize your shots in post-production. But this is both resource intensive and time consuming, and it doesn't always work. So before I talk about in-camera stabilization, I just wanted to quickly mention gimbals. Now these things are becoming cheaper and more sophisticated by the month. You've probably heard of the Steadicam, which is a huge piece of equipment that a cameraman will wear in order to stabilize the shots. Well, you can now get pretty much the same effect with something as small as this. All it means is clamping your camera onto this platform here, pre-configuring it so that when you turn it on, the camera is completely stable. It works on three axes, so you can move it around at any angle. So you can run it on the ground, you can have it up high. You can see the movement on it is pretty sophisticated. It creates some beautiful shots. Would I recommend it for vlogging? Yeah, yes and no. I think it gets a little bit heavy after a while, especially when you're holding it out and talking to camera yourself. It's not particularly practical. It is something I'd recommend if you are after some really buttery smooth shots. Also, they do make gimbal 
gimbals for smartphones. So there are smaller versions of these gimbals. So if you are just vlogging on a smartphone, then you might want to have a look at some of those gimbals. So back to cameras. This was the first prosumer camera to come out with five axis stabilization. And it's an Olympus OMD EM5. And the first 68 episodes of our vlog were shot using this camera. As you can see, it has a very small form factor. That's something I want to talk about in a minute is portability. Because of the five axis stabilization, it does produce some incredible, very smooth results and it avoids that jittering and movement. Now, of course, I've now replaced this with the GH5, which is what I'm recording this vlog on right now. But even when the GH4 came out, I was very interested in it because it's a bit of a filmmaker's camera, but it didn't have stabilization built in. I stuck with this until the GH5 came out. I mentioned portability. Back in the day when I was a photographer, I had a full frame Canon 5D2 and used to carry around a whole load of L lenses. I have to say, it used to give me backache. Lugging this equipment up mountains in India and even just the practicalities of using this gear in the cockpit on the boat was just very, very awkward. This gear is extremely heavy and if you compare some of these full frame DSLRs to the mirrorless cameras, you can see there's a huge difference in the size of them. So both the EM5 and the GH5 use the Micro Four Thirds format. Now, I don't want to go into this area too much. There are some trade-offs with the Micro Four Thirds format and I think some of you camera buffs will be aware of that and the trade-off with having a smaller sensor. But what it does mean is that everything is reduced in size. With the Micro Four Thirds format, you get the advantage of having very, very small lenses. Now, don't let this size deceive you because this is a pretty expensive 12mm Zuko prime lens. Because it's 12mm, when we put it on the Micro Four Thirds uh, sensor, we double it up. So it's the equivalent of a 24mm, so it's a pretty wide angle. And I have to say, it is one of the sharpest wide angle lenses I've ever used with very little barrel distortion. So you don't get too much distortion in the center of the image. You can see that when you put it on a Micro Four Thirds camera, like this, or even this 14mm uh, Panasonic pancake lens, suddenly you've got an entire piece of recording equipment in the palm of your hand. Don't underestimate the advantage of having this portability, especially when you're vlogging. So it means that you have this equipment on you all day. The characteristics of a prime lens is essentially you have a fixed focal length. So this means that you can't zoom in and out well, why would you want to use this instead of a zoom lens, which gives you more flexibility? Traditionally, a prime lens was sharper because it used less glass inside and there's no moving parts. Of course, they can make them smaller as well because there is less glass in them. But I think as a filmmaker, the biggest advantage is, and this sounds completely counterintuitive, but the advantage is, is that once you get used to that fixed focal length, you know exactly where to stand and where to compose your pictures. As a photographer, I shot pretty much exclusively on prime lenses. So when I moved into filmmaking, I stuck with the prime lenses. But there are times when a zoom lens can be very useful, especially if you're on a boat and you're restricted by how far you can move, you might see something on the horizon that you want to get into. Currently, I'm shooting with the Olympus 12 to 40 Pro, which is on the camera right now. This one is a 100 to 300. It's actually pretty cheap and plasticky, so I only used it in an emergency. But again, for that kind of range, which is the equivalent of 200 to 600, you can see how small this lens is when uh, it's not zoomed out. So I've been talking predominantly about mirrorless cameras. Mirrorless is different to your traditional DSLR in that they don't have the prism inside. And of course, this has a big impact on both the weight and the size. The traditional DSLR cameras, of course, is dominated by Canon and Nikon. I think don't make particularly good vlogging cameras simply because of their weight. They are very, very heavy. And especially when you put one of those lenses on. You have to remember, of course, that a lot of the time when you're vlogging, you're holding that camera up and talking to camera. And that does have an impact on your muscle power, basically. A big, strong, healthy lad like myself. I tell you what, after a few minutes of holding that camera out, it starts to wear. 
So the mirrorless market has eaten into the DSLR market, but both of these markets have been affected more recently by the smartphone market. And this is partly because younger people who want to get into photography are opting to buy some of these more modern smartphones which have very good cameras on them. Okay, so onto a subject now that a lot of people don't give so much priority towards, but is extremely important, and that is the quality of your audio. Now, have you ever sat down and watched the pirated movie where it's got really bad audio? No, of course you haven't, because watching pirate movies is illegal. But if you do watch a film and you've got a good picture, but the sound is terrible, more than likely you can't finish watching the film. There's something about the human brain that switches off to bad audio. On a boat, of course, audio is extremely compromised, especially when you've got wind and when you've got motion. What we do is we use external recorders and microphones. The microphone that I use on top of my GH5 is the Rode VideoMic Pro. This is a completely directional mono mic. What this means is, is that it only records the audio that it is pointing at. Because it's directional, it means that most of the sound around to the back is almost completely ignored. Now, if you point it in the right direction, this is a very good way of avoiding wind noises. And of course, on a boat, wind noises is a major concern. The problem with using an external mic mounted on the hot shoe of the camera is that you're relying on the internal circuitry of the camera to cope with the audio channel. And a lot of them aren't really geared up for that. So step in external audio recorders. Something like this. This is the Zoom H1, and we also have uh, an older Roland, which we used to use for podcasting. The idea of these is, of course, is that they are dedicated audio recorders, so in theory, the audio should be of a much higher quality than the mic on your camera. You then, of course, have to synchronize that audio in post-production, which sounds pretty horrific, but programs like Premiere Pro have auto sync features, so it's quite easy to synchronize two audio tracks within that program. Liz, meanwhile, has the Rode Video Micro, and that's the little, little, little beast here. Uh, the advantage of this one is that it doesn't need a battery to be powered, it just uses the power from the camera itself. It's slightly less directional, the quality isn't quite as good, but I have to say, for this price point, it's a pretty good mic, and it serves most purposes. After audio, of course, we have lighting. <laughs> Now I watched a video recently in which a vlogger was talking about vlogging on a boat and he made the bold statement that lighting is very easy, presumably because you're shooting out in the daylight most of the time. And I have to say it's a statement that I couldn't disagree with more. Lighting on a boat is extremely difficult to control. And of course lighting is the crux of photography, it's all about controlling that light. On a boat quite often you don't have control over that light especially if, for example, you are swinging around at anchor. The tide might change or the wind might pick up and, you, and then suddenly the light changes or there's a movement in the boat and all of a sudden the light shifts. So the changing light and the wind all contribute to a quite complex environment in which to record. So the first thing I would recommend is to use a filter. A circular polarizing filter is very good, especially in the tropics, where you might have sharp contrast between cloud, sky, sea, and greenery around you on the land. I should also mention neutral density filters as well, which just allow you to stop down the camera so that you can match your shutter speed or your shutter angle. Of course, when lighting gets really bad, then you can use uh, external lights. This is a very cheap, very simple, 120 LED array and it runs on a battery and the lighting is variable. I have to say the light that you get from this is a little bit harsh because it's a cheap light but you know sometimes a light is better than no light especially if you're recording in say the cockpit at night time and the advantage is that you can actually mount this on the camera using the hot shoe mount. But if you really want to go to town, then you can do what we've just done, and we've just purchased a studio light. And that's partly because we're doing more recording down below inside the boat, and the lighting down below is pretty bad. So the studio light allows for a, a much nicer, uh, diffused, wider light. It looks expensive and it looks cumbersome, but I think I paid about £150 sterling for this, and it all packs up into a couple of bags. Right, let's talk about tripods. This little trick is copyright Casey Neistat, and if you don't know who Casey Neistat is, go look him up. 
he came up with this grand idea and uh, this is called a gorilla and using a quick release you literally just pop your camera on like so it allows you to hold the camera out and give yourself further distance between yourself and the lens when you're talking to camera really really good idea of course a lot of the time you're not going to be using a tripod when you're vlogging because you're moving around so much but if you do get a tripod then get a travel one this is a manfrotto uh, it's actually one of their cheapest tripods i was led to believe that it extended to at least six foot because when you're doing interviews and talking to camera the lens ideally should be at least at eye height and maybe a little bit above this unfortunately only comes up to here so um that was a waste of money GoPros, most useful in bright sunlight outside and they're designed of course for action so they cope very well with uh, nice blue skies and bright sunlight. Would I use it as a vlogging camera? Not really, no. The people do, it is possible but because of its extremely wide angle it means that you're quite a long way from, from the lens. You have to get it in quite close to talk to camera and because of that near fisheye lens it does create quite a bit of distortion. I use the GoPro Best mounted on the back of the boat to get slow-mo shots and also to do time lapses. If you can't afford a GoPro then have a look at some of the clones on the market and there are hundreds out there you're probably already aware of them and may even own some. For my money I think the best clone is the SJ5000X. Take a look at it, it's a pretty neat little bit of kit. Of course GoPro cameras can also be used underwater and they're not bad for that at all. The problem again because of that uh, long distance between the lens and the subject it means you've got to get very close if you want to shoot coral or fish. So the alternative of course is to get dedicated housing for your camera and if you're big into diving then go for it but the problem with that is, is that they can be super expensive almost as much as the camera itself. If you're only interested in doing a little bit of underwater photography and filmmaking then something like this is good enough. I chose this one in particular because it shoots in a raw format for photography. It also has a zoom feature, it has flash, it's actually got built-in stabilization as well although I wouldn't say it works particularly well. The footage in this is pretty good. Because you can zoom in it means you can keep your distance from your subjects underwater. I just want to quickly talk about camcorders. Whatever happened to camcorders? They used to be so popular and they've been superseded now by all these uh, smaller compact mirrorless cameras. I was curious because we used to have a camcorder when we first started and it produced really good footage. Also Liz was looking for uh, her own camera and she found my camera a little bit too complicated so she wanted something that was very easy to use. So we got her this and this is one of the advantages of a camcorder is that it is pretty much press and record and that's it. Everything else is automated, it has built in stabilisation, this one shoots in 4K and it has something like a 30 times zoom on the lens. It's a pretty good solution and I have to say this, there's no reason why you can't vlog just on a camcorder. And just a quick word on drones. Now we used to have the splash drone which was quite useful because you could launch it from the water and you could land it in the water and to be honest that was just as well because this thing was so big and clunky you needed a lot of deck space to land it. We also had problems with the stabilisation. It used a GoPro in a waterproof housing which wasn't waterproof. I used to find I'd spend a lot of time in post-production trying to stabilise some of those very big GoPro files. So we swapped it for this. This I'm sure you recognise it's the Mavic and it is super super compact. Take a look at this. This is the rucksack that I carry my drone around in. It's tiny and I can fit the drone in there, spare battery, filters, the controller and the phone. And that really is the main advantage of this. Although it's not waterproof, it is extremely portable. So what this means is, is that when we go on land, we can chuck this in a rucksack and take it with us. The other advantage is the responsiveness of this thing. What this means is, is that we can actually hand land it and hand launch it. So you don't actually need a big deck space to land it on the boat. The other advantage is that you can set your return to home point to the controller itself rather than a physical GPS location. Of course the advantage of this I don't need to tell you is that when you're sailing on a boat and you launch it it's not using a GPS location somewhere down the coast because if it loses connection or the battery starts to run out and it wants to return to base it comes back to the controller and not to the middle of the ocean. So what camera would I recommend for vlogging? I don't think they have yet built the perfect vlogging camera. For me a vlogging camera has to be compact, 
it has to have a screen that you can turn around 180 degrees so that you can see yourself when you're talking to camera in order to compose the shot, make sure the lighting is right and to make sure you, that your focus is correct. It has to have an external mic input and this is especially important on a boat. And for those that want to push their camera a little bit further, it's quite useful to have a camera that can shoot in a flat profile, either raw or log, in order to do color grading later on in post-production. But of course, not everyone is particularly bothered by that, and it's not important for vlogging. But I still think a hot contender is the OMD EM5. It ticks most of those boxes. You can see how compact it is. You can take off lenses and change them. It's got that flip out screen, and it's also got that audio input as well. Of course, I've now swapped it for the GH5, and that's because it doesn't shoot in a proper flat profile, and it doesn't shoot in 4K. So would I recommend the GH5 as a vlogging camera? Well, yes and no, it depends how far you want to push the technicalities of the camera. The GH5 is, I think, one of the best prosumer cameras on the market. Its range of functions on it is phenomenal. You can shoot in 10-bit in 60 frames a second 4K. You can change the shutter angle as opposed to the shutter speed. There's all sorts of features on there which make it a very, very good camera. So if you really want to get into that side of things, then yes, it's probably one of the best cameras out there at the moment, within a certain budget, of course. I think top of my list of vlogging cameras at the moment have to be Panasonic's and Sony's. Sony does make a great range of cameras, and I did look at them, but there were a few reasons why I didn't opt for a Sony in the end. The first is that the battery life on a lot of the Sony models is terrible. And of course, when you're vlogging, you need a decent battery and the GH5 battery lasts a lot longer. You don't want to be walking around with your charger in your bag when you go out vlogging for the day. So it's easy to carry spare batteries. And because the Sony doesn't last very long, you've got to carry a lot of batteries. The other problem that Sony is plagued with is overheating. And this is something that bothers me a little. A long session to camera like this, when the camera overheats, it will turn off and you've got to wait until that camera cools down. And of course, especially in the tropics and on the boat, you need a camera that can handle that. The other thing with Sony cameras is that their stabilization isn't a patch on the five axis stabilization of the EM5 and the GH5. That said, I think Sony do make some incredible cameras and I would seriously recommend you go out and try some of them. So I keep talking about Sony's and Panasonic's and mirrorless cameras, and I'm doing this for a reason. Traditional full frame DSLR camera does not make a good vlogging camera. It's just simply too heavy and too cumbersome. And finally, to reiterate my original point, it doesn't matter what gear you film on, it's all about the story. Okay, well, I hope that was helpful to those of you wanting to get into vlogging. I'm sure there's quite a few out there who are bang into their cameras and already do a lot of filmmaking and probably know a lot more about it than I do. So you can correct me in the comments below. Love to know what you think and what your ideas are. I'll stay online when this goes live and try and answer some of your questions. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And when you hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell as well, because then you get notified when we send out our weekly vlog and we're now starting to put out two extra videos on your questions and answers. So we're putting out three videos a week. And of course, we're going to be live streaming as well. So you'll get a notification when we go live. Thanks for watching. Peace and fair winds.